The High Priestess by Nina Rudnikova. The first arcanum, the magician, is presented as the divine essence, the nature that determines whose astrological correspondence is the sun and whose numerical designation is one. The second arcanum, the high priestess, is the primary energy, life, the divine substance, the feminine principle, defining nature, whose astrological correspondence is the moon and whose numerical designation is two. It is recommended to take the following steps. Separate your physical body from yourself. Analyze this state and understand that the analyzer and the analyzed are not the same thing and that the analyzer in relation to the analyzed is a subject separate from the object, independent of it. Do you not identify your I with your feelings? So you will master the secret of self-control. Concentrate on your thoughts. Be able to analyse them. Understand that again the subject analyses them, dominating them. The mastery of thoughts leads to the possibility of conscious thought creation. Apply the same analysis to the area of your spiritual and religious life. Understand that the ideal you set is only the revelation of your higher self. By ceasing to identify yourself even with the spiritual ideal, you will achieve self-consciousness, self-immersion in the immortal ocean of your own spirit, merged with the spirit of the universe and eternally affirming the principle of universal unity. The primordial matter, before it emerges from the once unmanifested plane and awakens to the thrill of action under the impulse of Fohat, is only a cold radiance, colourless, without form or taste, and devoid of all quality and aspect. The aspects of primordial matter are mother of mercy and knowledge, mother wife and daughter of the Logos, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, refers to the feminine, Shakti or energy, nature of this trinity. Elena P. Blavatsky writes, in the Trans-Himalayan teachings, this is the mother or abstract ideal matter, Mula Prakriti, the root of nature, from the metaphysical point of view, the correlate of Adi, Buddhi, manifested in the Logos, Avalokiteshvara, and from the purely occult and cosmic point of view, Fohat, son of suns, the two-pronged energy emanating from this light of the Logos, manifesting on the planes of the objective universe, both the latent and the manifested electricity, which is life. The mantra for the first arcanum, the magician, is I am, which means I am eternal, immortal and free. Nothing can destroy me. I can't disappear anywhere. Nothing can harm me. In all the changes of life, I am. I is the true cause and witness of all the changes and all the transformations of consciousness, matter, mula prakriti, 
the root of everything, is indestructible and eternal. If every manifestation of consciousness, whether reflexive or direct, or unconscious, premeditation, belongs to spirit, then matter must be regarded as objectivity in its purest abstraction, as a self-existent basis, the sevenfold manvantaric differentiations of which constitute the objective reality behind the manifestest manifestations of all phases of consciousness and physical existence. During the Pralaya period, the cosmic thought base did not seem to exist. On the Manvantara, the spirit is twofold and nature is born. The second arcanum, objectification which contains the foundations of all forms, life completeness, life giving and affirming, the supreme subject, the self, the spirit, the principle of love, the supreme object, you, matter, the principle of wisdom. The subject is the centre, manifesting in the encompassed and the periphery. Between the centre and the periphery, the relationship is expressed in mutual attraction. The subject is attracted to the object. By the thirst for manifestation, the object is attracted to the subject by the thirst for union with it. Love is eternally self-radiating, and the love created by this radiation is eternally striving to reveal the hidden essence, love. This is the basis of all forms of cosmic attraction, from the spiritual attraction of God to the spiritual attraction of God. The second principle of Arcanum is the idea of polarising the cosmic environment. Once in the cosmos, principle is manifested. This principle can only be based on the beginning of polarisation, that is, on the relationship of two essentially homogeneous principles. And if there is a polarisation, then there is a centre and a periphery. The principle of life reveals a centrifugal orientation, that is, it proceeds from the centre, and the essence of the principle of love, always and everywhere striving for unity, asserts ever more complete syntheses and is the manifestation of a centripetal force. The principle of life differentiates the divine possibilities. The principle of love directs them back to the divine essence. And like this fundamental force of polarisation, all the phenomena of life are polarised as a consequence of basic duality. The manifested world is based on the principle of duality. There is no unity in it, but there is behind the screen of manifestation. The philosophical principle of the first arcanum is the principle of a single static space. The second principle is the principle of eternal, boundless movement, that is, time. In the manifested world, each phenomenon must be considered as containing two poles, two poles. One, the positive pole, will be the moment of the centripetal direction of the phenomenon, and the other, the negative pole, will the, be the moment of the centrifugal tendency and, since the centripetal direction depends on the tension and self-relation of the inner subjective core, this pole is called active. The objective pole, that is, the centrifugal orientation, depends on the quality of the subject's environment of influence and is a passive pole in relation to the latter. The goal of human life is liberation from duality through its cognition.
The second arcanum contains both a single and a multiple principle of self-consciousness. And the desire of self-consciousness for truth is the will to rise from a differentiated form to spiritual unity, that is, to the affirmation of true love. But in his quest for liberation from differentiated forms, man must connect the poles of his spiritual attitude during his journey through the unmanifested world. Only by solving the problem of integrating the two into the common principle that unites this two can the correct path from form to spirit be found. Otherwise, some of the forms, the counterpole which is not found, can be taken for the incomprehensible divine principle, and this will close the only possibility of reaching the truth. At the same time, it must be remembered that the latter duality cannot be synthesized by anything that has a name, a form. The problem of the human spirit and its search are reduced to the correct setting of the poles. The poles that are correct in relation to each other are called binaries. Examples of correct binaries are as follows. Unmanifest, manifest. Infinite, finite. Evolution, involution. Impersonal, personal. Centrifugal, centripetal. Spirit, form etc. Incorrect binaries lead to philosophical confusion and form a fantastic worldview that does not correspond to cosmic reality and therefore remains an empty abstraction. Such other theories constructed philosophically on the wrong opposition of spirit matter, for there is no real matter and material forms are one of the static forms in general. It is also impossible to contrast absolute good and absolute evil because both are relative and change depending on the level of consciousness and the stage of manifestation of life. It is similarly impossible to oppose the principle of life and the principle of death because death is not a principle but only a transition from one stage of life to another the opposite of which will be birth. The correct binary is birth, death. Life on all the main four planes of its manifestation is always dual in its direction. On all the planes of manifestation, there are two of its currents. The first from the center to the periphery and the second from the periphery to the center. In the spiritual life of a person, these two directions are reflected. The first esoterically by wisdom, the second esoterically by worship of God. At the heart of each religion is the centripetal force, the basis of the search for truth of a free and self-standing spirit. But each religion is revealed by the cult worship of God materialising spiritual achievements with a physical symbol. The intellectual life of man is also dual. The human mind on the one hand strives the recognition and analysis of the objective world, thus creating science. On the other hand, man wants to know his own synthetic formula and, synthesising the acquired knowledge according to the aspiration, reshapes it into self-consciousness, that is, into philosophy. The duality of a person's psychic life is revealed in self-affirmation on the one hand and self-denial on the other. The first is based on the search for truth, the second on the service of the common good. The environment, on the one hand, belongs to the fundamental ethical binary and, finally, the great duality of the embodied life is the division into two sexes. There is a binary, man, woman. 
which in its final form contains, symbolises and embodies all the duality of the manifestation of the world. The man-woman binary reflects the entire creative organisation of the cosmos on our planet as a result of the interaction of polarity on different planes of life manifestation. In many occult theories and books, the male principle is mistaken for an absolutely active, initiative radiating, and the female principle is mistakenly drawn in relation to the male as passive, perceiving and bearing. In fact, both principles on direct planes of manifestation are active and passive, maintaining the correct polarisation in relation to each other. The female principle in the spiritual world is active, proactive and radiating, and the male principle in the spiritual world, in relation to the female, is passive, receptive and bearing. This is why, on the intellectual plane of consciousness, the male principle is actively and creatively formulates the spiritual material received from the female principle. The feminine principle, which is intellectually discerning, distinguishes the true from the false, the essential from the non-essential in mental formations. In the psychic world, both principles are passive and active, but the direction of their activity is mutually opposite. The masculine principle puts ideological formulations in images and representations and seeks to realise them with an energy flow on the physical plane, where it is the creative principle. The feminine is the great alchemist of the universe, sublimating, spiritualising and transforming the inner beauty and harmony of the forms of the world. It is the beginning that dissolves gross forms in subtle manifestations and subtle manifestations in the radiance of the spirit. In the physical world, the male principle is active and is its master. The female principle is passive and its passivity is expressed in the art of adaptation. From this polarisation follows the universal cooperation of both principles. A thoughtful mind can always draw consequence from the indicated opposites of male and female and will understand that no one phenomenon exists. The world cannot be created one-sidedly by one of the principles. The secret of the stability of forms and the correspondence of their cosmic reality lies in the harmonious cooperation of the two basic principles. The Book of Nature which the woman of the second arcanum holds on her lap is opened before the eyes of everyone who sees the secret of mutual polarizations. All nature is the result of harmonious creativity and mutual self-creation of the great principles and the narrative of the colour scheme of their identification. On our earth, man's thought creation makes him the master of material life and the representative of cosmic intelligence on earth. The directly perceiving heart of a woman opens up to the awareness of spiritual possibilities that seek to be realised on our earth, puts spiritual guidance in her hands, makes her a representative of spirit making, a carrier of the heart. We see from the comparison of different planes the polarisation of the feminine principle the duality of its nature, while the man always adheres to the same orientation. The same duality is reflected in the two aspects of woman on earth, the woman wife and the woman mother. Both of these aspects should be understood not in the zoological, but in the spiritual, in the psychic sense. As a wife, a woman adapts to a man, being his assistant and obeying him in everything external. After all, the masculine principle determines the order of phenomena in the environment. It is the subject of external manifestations, putting its imprint on the environment. On the other hand, the feminine principle as a spiritual leader is the mother of a man, and even of her own husband. After all, 
the medium of influence is as divine as the subject of self-consciousness that manifests in it. When it has finished its manifestation, it dissolves in this medium, and the great ways of life plunge the ego back into the unity of love. As a spiritual mother, a woman is an educator and a great alchemist, transforming the male consciousness and thus all of his creativity. The internal subjective domination of the feminine over the masculine provides the latter with the right direction and the possibility of returning to the bosom of the spiritual world. Therefore, woman's love is most reflected in the essence of the very principle of love which is the affirmation of the unity of the spirit. The spiritually active feminine principle is the carrier of the pure principle of love, the one divine power of the universe. Therefore, the concept of God in the image of the mother of the world is the highest concept of man about God. After all, it is the mother of the world, the Holy Spirit, who transforms all the forms of the world and its whole, saves it, that is, brings it to its original spiritual state. The mother of the world lovingly carries all its forms and images, created by revealing the possibilities of the father of self-consciousness. The great one life accumulated by love, the stream of manifestation of life inseparably merged with love along the spirals of the cosmos, transfers this love from the great to the small, from the small again to the great, uniting the beings of the universe in one divine brotherhood. The covenant of the mother of the world is self-abandonment both up and down, that is, complete non-identification with any manifestation. Self-abandonment downwards is the readiness of an unbiased, direct the spiritual perception. This same self-abandonment in relation to the manifestation makes it possible to consciously perceive the great song of life and identify with its flow as a whole. <clears throat> Thus, by renouncing the part, we get the whole. By renouncing a single gulp, we get the full cup of life. And this merging with the flow of life opens up the possibility of subjective self-affirmation of consciousness at any stage of its manifestation, as a carrier and expression of great love. The identification of consciousness with the whole stream of life is the cosmic consciousness, which feels and experiences all the objects of the world, and the whole object of manifestation as itself, with a great and never, never weary sympathy. And finally, a whole reign of forms, facts and phenomena from it is radiated by these psychic formations that unite them. Scheme, schematically, this can be represented as follows. Subject, mental plane, intellectual plane, spiritual plane, physical plane. Life is boundless and infinite for it manifests the boundlessness and infinity of possibilities contained in the ineffable absolute. Dissolving some of the possibilities of self-consciousness, it causes him to thirst for new accumulations, makes him draw more and more new potentials from the ocean of the unmanifest and again realises them, carrying them through the infinity of spaces and times and again, synthesising them in the radiance of the spirit, constantly manifesting in relation to the Aleph, the first, the principle, as a submissive wife and as a protective mother. So, at the root of the unmanifested cosmic nature lies the principle of duality, which means that for its manifestation, the unity of potential must always be polarised, split into plus and minus, or into the subject and object of manifestation. This polarisation passes through all the worlds, and as you move away from the centre to the periphery, that is, from the spiritual plane of manifestation to the physical, all diseases are differentiated. 
the great spiritual syntheses, the principles of the manifested world, are each differentiated into whole systems of ideas. Each idea is repeatedly polarised into images and representations, its energetic manifestations on the psychic plane. These differentiating polarizations form a whole network of manifestations of the world. The threads of the world are intertwined, and to find the corresponding pole in this network of polarization is exactly what is called wisdom. The practice of the correct opposites, binaries, in one's activity and life is called the art of living. From the statements of poles which do not correspond to each other, all wrong and groundless worldviews follow, and from the application of such worldviews in life, only an incorrect karmic confusion can result, burdening the individual paths of human evolution. Therefore, the content of the second arcanum is wisdom, just as the content of the first arcanum is love. The root of wisdom lies in the correct perception of cosmic correspondences, in the recognition of true and false, in the feeling of the universal principle of love. Therefore, wisdom is a manifestation of the heart, a manifestation of the feminine principle. In the centrifugal flow of manifestations from the radiations of the centre to the absorbing periphery, the primary radiation of love is differentiated into increasingly partial and diverse condensed forms of manifestation. In the opposite direction, from the periphery to the centre, in the flow of integration, that is, the connection of the main components into one whole, of disparate forms in the unifying flow of the spirit, in the alchemical work of transforming the material, the female plays a leading role. It brings all created things back to their original unity, awakening the ego in the consciousness of each phenomenon and affirming it by the mutual connection of all that is manifested its innermost essence. This consciousness of connection with all that exists is the form of consciousness called cosmic consciousness. As Vivekananda says, to know God, we must all become women. In every form, in every phenomenon, two streams of differentiation and integration cross. Where the centrifugal direction prevails, forms are in a state of involution, that is, in a state of expiring their creative potential. Where the centrifugal direction prevails, forms are in a state of evolution, that is, in a state of unfolding their spiritual essence. This law is clearly manifested on earth and in the life of nations. Peoples who are involutional, that is, ageing, expiring of their creative possibilities and impoverished in spirit, live under the sign of the suppression of the feminine principle. Among such peoples, the woman plays a secondary role and is enslaved by the gradually coarsening male principle. Among the evolving peoples who follow the path of spiritualization of their manifestations, that is, the path of cultural construction, the woman begins to play an increasingly important role. Therefore, the cultural level of the people, that is, the level of their spirituality, can be assessed by their attitude to women and the degree of respect that they show for women's spirit making. On this basis, you can find out which peoples are on the descending line of decreasing and narrowing consciousness and which are on the ascending line of increasing and expanding consciousness in their cultural development. The harmonious cooperation of both sexes protects the people from becoming wild since the feminine principle will always bring new spiritual possibilities into their psyche and give material to the male realisational creativity. Such peoples would be protected from spiritual impoverishment and therefore from death. The harmonious cooperation of the two principles would ensure the immortality of the peoples, that is, the possibility of unlimited cultural development. Cosmic consciousness, that is, 
the knowledge or direct experience of deep connection between all forms of periphery and centre is best expressed by the formula, not I, but you. For every you as I, in any you felt me, without distinction of planes on which this you is manifest. This formula is the mantra of the second arcanum. The threads of the mother of the world stretch from top to bottom, from the centre to every point in the periphery, and in this centre their unity is confirmed, which determines the connection between them. Therefore, you cannot love your neighbour without loving God. It is possible to assert a connection between the forms of the periphery and not establish the principles of common good whilst rejecting their deep unity. God? Only by seeking the truth, by striving for the centre, that is, by loving God, can we vividly and directly feel the connection with our neighbour and work for the common good. The second arcanum is the principle that reveals to us the secret of the attraction of the periphery to the centre, established by the beginning of the heart, the beginning of the female. Wisdom consists in a clear discernment between the spirit and the spirit and its manifestation, between the eternal subject and the boundless objectivity of its self-revelation. Wisdom establishes the correct relationship between these basic polarities, which are reflected in the whole variety of cosmic interpolarizations. And this is a reading from The Solar Way, Arcana of the Tarot by Nina Pavlona Rudnikova.